Okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started right away. I think there's people still jumping in, but uh, I wanna get going right away here at one. So first off, um, I wanna welcome everyone uh, to the session today. We have invited you here today um, to review the basic record keeping requirements for the USDA school meals program. The goal of this session is to review the training packet that was sent to all of you. And hopefully everyone was able to watch the training videos, um, part one and four and direct certification prior to the session today. We have a few housekeeping items to review quickly. Um, if you could type your email in the chat box, this way we, we can send out a certificate for the training. Um, also use the chat box to ask any questions. And we're gonna do the questions at the end of the session. We're gonna go through the packet. So if you can either type them in the chat box or if you're not comfortable doing that, just write them down and save them to the end of the session. You can turn on your video and, and camera if it's available. Please mute yourself during the presentation and have your packet ready um, if you are able to follow along, if you're able to get it printed off. Our agenda for today, presenting today is myself, Allie. We also have Sean, Erica, and Marianne who are gonna help us through the packet and answer questions. We're going to review the packet like I mentioned before, and then we have time saved at the end of the session to go through all your questions. So Sean will get us started. Give me just a moment to pull up the packet. Okay, a, a big welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the first page of your packet um, contains the certificate for continuing education hours for um, today's training. Um, you may complete the certificate. You are earning two hours of CEU um, training hours for today. The next couple of pages are the table of contents for information contained in the packet. In today's training, we will be reviewing the information contained in each section of the table of contents. You may want to compile this information in a notebook for reference later. And we will go ahead to the, this page, important date. Um, as with any program your school participates in, there are important dates to be aware of. The start of the program year for the school meals program is July 1st with an ending date of July 30th. I'm sorry, eh, not July 30th, June 30th. Um, so the program year runs July 1st through June 30th. At the end of the important dates handout, you will find dates for the claim reimbursement submission. So if we proceed to the next page, we will see at the bottom of the page is information about claim submission. You may find it helpful to keep the important dates handout available for easy um, reference as you proceed through the school year. Thanks. The Nutrition Services Directory provides contact information for staff working in the child nutrition programs administered by the Nebraska Department of Education. These include the school meals program, the summer food service program, and the child and adult care um, food program. There is also contact information for financial services. Um, those are the folks that process the claims for reimbursement. The USDA um, Foods Office, which is administered by the Department of Health and Human Services. And we also have contact information 
um, for Mandy Carney, who is the head of the Food Safety Health Inspections. The next page in your packet is the web address for the Nebraska Department of Education Nutrition Services. This is a very important link to bookmark as program information and forms are contained on this website. Under the Nutrition Services Home is the School Meals Program and the different links in this program, such as the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, the very important forms and resource section, information on training, the school breakfast program, special milk program, and the after school care snack program. At the bottom of the page is the link for the child nutrition program, which when clicked it allows access to the school meals application and claims. And we'll come back to that link in a little bit. I've already mentioned the forms and resource section, and we are coming back to it on this handout. When you click on the link, it takes you into the forms and resource center. The center is divided into three sections, administration, food service, and regulations and policies. The forms and information section you will be using are found in the first section. We'll go on to the next form. This form in your packet is the Nutrition Services Computer Access Application and Agreement. Yeah, you can print out. This form is completed whenever there is a change in authorized representative for the school meals program. The authorized representative is the designated person responsible for the administration of the school meals program. They ensure the rules and regulations of the program are adhered to. This form must be completed and returned to nutrition services so a new ID and password can be issued for the new authorized representative. As we previously looked at the access to the online application claim system, we can find that it's on the main page of the Nutrition Services homepage. Once the link is clicked, it takes you into the CNP page, Child Nutrition Program page, which requires the ID and password for logging on. Once logged on, you will see a screen similar to this, which identifies the program the sponsor participates in. By clicking on the blue square entry in the school nutrition program, you, are, you have access to that program. As we look more on this page, we can see the same colorful block at the top um, upper right hand corner. Clicking on this box allows us to navigate from program to program um, if we are participating in more than one. We can also click on year which will show us several school years and by clicking on the school year you are able to view information from past years. Once we click on the blue box, we want to click on application, which will take us into our school meals application. Under applications, I want to point out there are several main areas you will be using. These include the application packet, the verification report, completing information for the food safety inspection, 
the financial report for non-public schools and institutions and the direct certification, direct verification information. The lower section of this page shows what information is contained in the application packet. So as we look at this page or lower section, we can see we're looking at the 2020-21 application packet. When we click on the direct certification, direct verification link, we are taken into the direct certification system. In this area, we can view our school's match list of directly certified students. Directly certified means we have matched these students with the health and human services databases for assistance programs such as SNAP, HANA, Foster, Medicaid Free, Medicaid Reduced, Income Based Medicaid. Other tabs to point out on this page include individual student lookup. Um, this is used for matching individual student information with the Health and Human Services database. We have our possible match list. Um, what possible match list means that maybe the student is directly certified, but the system is not 100% for sure um, that they are our student or your school student. And so by looking at the possible match list, you determine if that is your student or not, and you can accept them onto your match list. Another area on this screen is the direct verification. And I don't want to confuse anyone with this terminology versus regular verification, which Mary Ann in, in a few more slides will be discussing. Direct verification is not the same. Direct verification is an optional feature in the system. This feature can be completed prior to contacting a household for verification um, to see if they are directly verified for eligibility prior to starting regular verification. As I mentioned, this is an optional feature. Schools are not required to directly verify students, but it is available on the direct certification system um, page. As we move on down, I previously mentioned qualifying assistance programs, and by clicking in the maintenance tab, you can view the program character, which will appear on the direct certification match list, and the full description of what the assistance program is. So for example, the program character is S, that is an abbreviation for SNAP, or that is the program character for SNAP, and SNAP stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So we do have um, what those characters are um, identified under the maintenance tab. Marianne, I will let you start talking about um, the application process. Thanks, Sean. Yes, I'm going to talk about free and reduced price meal applications. So uh, the very first handout here, I'm sure uh, you've already been working with this. I know the process is well underway in your school. Um, this is the tool that is used to approve meal applications. As Sean mentioned earlier, our program year runs July 1 through June 30th. So this form is updated on an annual basis. So please make sure that you're always using the most current version of this form. Um, 
This form is not to be distributed to your households because it contains both free and reduced price guideline information. Um, and in order to use this form, what, uh, what you need to know is obviously your household size and then the frequency with which the household income was calculated to determine if the household does qualify for free or reduced price meals. This screenshot is taken from our website. It is a complete listing of all of our attachments, A through L, and our focus uh, today is going to be on attachments A through E and attachment L. So then we have attachments A through L populate on this next screenshot. These forms, you can go back, yes. Uh, these forms are all available as Word documents so that you're able to add information where needed. In the next section on training, uh, our training of course has been updated and is available as a series of videos that can be watched along with other resources available for you. And the last thing on this particular um, page, uh, USDA's meal application is available in a variety of different languages and we have a number of the attachments that are listed above available in Spanish. <clears throat> Next. So then we have a number of our different attachments here that we're just going to run through and touch base on. Attachment B is a required form that must be sent to your household. This four page letter, which is sent, um, the first two pages um, address a variety of different questions and answers for your households. And the last two pages are the instructions for completing the meal application. Okay. Next, we have attachment C, which is our meal application. <clears throat> this is a two page form. Uh, in the training that you watched, I did go through seven different examples of completing and approving um, a variety of different um, applications. So um, hopefully you had the opportunity to take a look at, at those different examples. Um, we're not going to go through each section of the application, but I did want to point out that um, you know, if a household reports a master case number in part two, you are looking for a five to a nine digit number. Uh, in part three, I would point out where household members are listed. If income is reported, make sure that you have a frequency identified as well. Otherwise, you need to follow up with that household. Never assume the frequency. Make sure they have listed the last four digits of their social security number or they have checked the box that they do not have one. Uh, we're looking for a signature in part four. Uh, racial ethnic information in part five is optional. And schools are required to complete the bottom portion of the meal application. I did want to, at this time, I did want to mention, well, if you take a look at the top of page two, we do provide the reduced price guidelines to your households. So that information is available. Um, but at this time, I did want to mention carryover. Uh, carryover, you know, any student who qualified for free or reduced price meals at the end of the previous school year is allowed to carry over those benefits for the first 30 school days or until the student's name appears either on your direct certification list or you have received a new household application for the year, whichever occurs first. Um, so at this time, you know, we're many of you, we're probably close to approaching that 30th day. So hopefully you've got that date identified. And <clears throat> at this time, you know, if you have a student who has not appeared on the direct cert list or you haven't gotten a new application, and previously they had been receiving benefits, our recommendation is that you 
contact them about oh seven to ten days you know prior to that 30th day just send them a reminder and include a copy of uh, I would include a copy of the application as well and just remind them that um, we need to have this information on file or they go to full pay meals on day 31. Next we have um, attachment D, which is our approval or denial letter. Um, we have one approval letter that can be used whether a student is directly certified or approved with an application. Um, software generated letters can be used, but please make sure that it contains similar language to what is found here in attachment D. One of the things that we typically find is that, uh, Allie, if you want to scroll down a little bit towards uh, second page, I think, yeah, just oftentimes the non-discrimination statement has not been updated in, in the uh, software generated letters. So please double check and make sure you've got the most current non-discrimination statement listed. Next, we have attachment D3. Notice of a change in benefits. We created this letter for schools in case a household needs to be notified if an error is discovered. And what I would point out here is if household benefits increase, the change in eligibility for that household can be immediate. Or if a household is losing benefits, you must give them a 10 calendar day notice. And the day, the day you would send the letter would count as day one. Okay, next we have attachment E, uh, computing income for self-employed individuals. This is an optional form that can be sent to your households. So in, addi in addition to attachment B, uh, the, the uh, household letter and a copy of the application, um, some school districts choose to include attachment E as well. We often see it sent um, in rural areas, you know, where households are engaged in farming. Uh, when you take a look at this form, you know, individuals who are self-employed, we are allowed to take a look at a tax return. And in the last couple of years, the tax return has changed. So um, information that is required on attachment E is now coming from two different locations on the tax return. And we have identified those locations there for you. So when you have totaled up um, the five lines listed, um, that amount can then be transferred to the last column of the household application under all other income. Okay, next we have uh, sharing information with other programs. This too is an optional form. However, if your school waives fees or offers discounts, on programs based on based on a student's free or reduced price eligibility, you must have a signed form on file from the student's parent or guardian um, releasing this information to be used in those other programs. Um, it's important to keep in mind that when a household completes a meal application, they are applying for meal benefits only. You know, this is confidential information. And so again, if it's going to be shared with other programs within your school, you must have a uh, parent signature on file releasing the information. Um, I think this form really came into, um, came into being when, um, you know, colleges would, would contact high school guidance counselors asking, you know, if this student qualifies for free or reduced. You know, and of course we want to be able to, you know, assist in any way, but again, in order to release that information from a meal application, you need to have permission from the parent. So we see, uh, you know, 
that college information, yeah, that's listed, scholarships, um, sometimes school bus transportation, band uniforms, there's just a variety. And so the number of programs listed in which you may provide a waiver really depends on the fee waivers available at your school. Okay, the last page here, um, just wanna point out uh, is USDA's eligibility manual for school meals. Um, this resource is going to cover a variety of topics um, associated with uh, school meal eligibility. And um, it's broken down into different sections. And at the end of each section, it's, as I said, it's really all inclusive and it contains a variety of different questions and answers. So, Hopefully many of you have actually seen a copy of this manual at your school. Otherwise it is available on our website. Okay, the next thing that I would like to talk about is verification. And I'm gonna talk maybe in a little bit more detail on verification because it's probably the next thing that needs to be completed. Um, however, we are still waiting to hear from USDA whether the process of verification is going to be required this year or not. Now that schools are being given the opportunity to switch from the National School Lunch Program to the Summer Feeding Program, where everyone eats for free, we're still in a holding pattern waiting to find out if verification needs to be completed or not. But I'll still give you an overview of the process. So the process actually begins October 1, in which you are asked to count up the number of meal applications that you have on file. Um, we're talking paper applications. This is not the number of students who qualify for free or reduced, but rather the number of applications. Um, and as you count up those applications, make sure that you have removed any applications in which a student is on your direct certification list. Um, any student who's on the direct certification list is is already verified so we ask that you pull those applications and file them separately so once you have the number of applicate you you've counted up you know the number of applications it should be only for those students that this is how they are eligible for free or reduced price meals then you take that total count and you multiply it by 3%. And whatever that number happens to be, if it ends up being some part of a, uh, some part of a decimal, then you need to round up. Now, first thing then after that is um, you're going to need to contact your household. And for that, you are going to use attachment F. So I believe, yes. It's listed, it's listed right there. Go back a little bit. There, yeah. Um, I think the actual, I think the actual online page has been updated that there's additional forms listed besides just attachment F. But attachment F is the notification letter that is sent to your households. Uh, we ask that you give them approximately 10 days to two weeks at the very most to um, return documentation. Uh, supporting the income that they reported on their application. By law, if you have not heard from that household within the time frame you identified, then you need to follow up one more time requesting information. Once you have all the documentation, you know, you must review it and determine the household's income um, based, on, based on what was submitted to you. Then you're going to go back and you're going to compare that amount of income along with household size. You're gonna go back to that income eligibility chart to see if the household still qualifies for meal benefits. Once you've completed that process, 
you then need to notify all of you'll need to notify the households that applied and so then you are asked to send the results letter which is attachment G in addition to attachment G we also ask you to complete what is called a tracker form and that is attachment H2 and the tracker form is specific to each household that was selected for verification. And that's exactly what it does. It just tracks where you are in the process of receiving information from the household, kind of start to finish. And it allows you to sign off and attach that tracker form to the um, meal application if you so choose. With any of the documentation that has been submitted by your household, you are to, all of that must be kept on file so that it's available for us to review when we're out conducting an administrative review. Okay, we can move along. All right, next thing is then we want to talk about the verification report, the online report, which is required to be completed by November 15th each year. Okay. We have actually provided a copy of the form, a uh, copy of the online form um, that will need to be completed. Um, again, we're not going to go through this line by line, but one of the things I wanted to point out, you know, section one is just asking for some general information regarding your school. But what I wanted to bring to your attention is, um, please notice that over on the right hand side, we have two columns. And just make sure, you know, column A, column A is asking for the number of schools, whereas column B is asking for the number of students. So please make sure that when you are completing this report that you are entering numbers in the correct column. Allie, if you want to slide that up a little bit, section two is not going to, does not apply to the majority of schools in Nebraska. Um, these are school districts that have a very high percentage of students who qualify for free or reduced price meals. And these school districts participate in either provision two or the community eligibility provision program. And so, someone at your school would know if you are participating in either of those programs. So the majority of school districts do not have to complete section two. What I would point out then in section three is that this section deals specifically with recording numbers of your directly certified students only. And then when you get to section four, you are recording information regarding students who are approved for free or reduced price meal benefits based on a meal application. So those two sections are separated. Again, section three, direct certification, section four, meal applications. Section five is really, the, is really a, a summary of, the, of your verification efforts. Um, there are two types of verification that can be used. We have standard or error prone. And error prone verification refers to those households, excuse me, refers to those school districts that had greater than a 20% error in completing the process last school year. And our director, Katie Parch, will soon be sending out an email to those schools that are required to conduct error-prone verification this year. Otherwise, the other option is alternate one or random, which means just that. It's just a random sample of the number of applications that need to be verified. Uh, the third bullet does not apply to us. Here, we're not, we don't use that here in Nebraska. All right, um, and then moving along, uh, section 5-8 looks a little, looks like maybe there's quite a bit to do with that, but really it's a pretty simple chart to complete. You are taking a look at columns A, B, and C. That's where you start. 
And in taking a look at those columns, this is the original approval for that household that was selected for verification. And then the results go down the left-hand side. We have number one, responded no change, number two, changed from reduced to free, number three, they changed to paid, or number four, they did not respond at all. So it's not that something has to be filled in every box, it's just a matter again of identifying the column to begin with and then what was the result. The last thing that you see there is VC-1, talking about verifying applications for cause. You certainly have the right to select a questionable application. Um, if you choose to do that, that application would be in addition to the number of applications that the district is required to verify. However, we always point out that you need to be very careful in doing verification for cause um, to ensure that no one's civil rights are being violated. And that's what I'm going to say about the verification report. And now I'm going to turn it over to Erica. Thank you, Marianne. So next we will be talking about the point of service meal count. Proper meal counting is very, very important as your school is receiving federal reimbursement for meals served to eligible students that meet program requirements. As the bookkeeper, you may be the person responsible for the point of service meal count and identifying reimbursable school meals. This meal count handout um, outlines proper meal counting procedures and also lists unacceptable meal count systems for your reference. Please note that a point of service meal count is required, and this is defined by regulation as a meal count taken at that point in the food service line where it can be accurately determined that a reimbursable free, reduced price, or paid lunch and or breakfast has been served to an eligible child. The end of the serving line is considered the point of service. This is after all foods that contribute to the meal pattern, including any uh, fruit and vegetable bars have been offered to the students. There are um, some rare exceptions to an end of the line meal count. If the point of service meal count cannot be completed at the end of the line, a waiver to this requirement must be submitted each year with your school meals application and, and approved by NDE Nutrition Services. You go down a little bit um, towards the bottom. It lists, um, there are some examples of acceptable meal counting methods. Um, a couple examples would be manually marking a paper roster as each student receives a reimbursable meal. Or many schools use a computer software system where the students enter a PIN number or maybe a barcode is scanned and the system then compiles the number of free, reduced, and paid meals served each day based on the student eligibility information that has been entered into the system. Some, uh, as the handout states, some of the important points to remember here are counts taken in the classroom, attendance counts in the morning, the number of tickets sold or issued, head counts, tray counts, and counts obtained by backing out any number of lunches or breakfast served are not considered point of service meal counts and are not allowed. Oh, uh, back up just a little bit, Allie. Yeah. Um, also note that color coding or single symbol coding of tickets or rosters by category, such as free, reduced, or paid are prohibited. So for example, you cannot issue all of the free students a blue ticket, all of the reduced students a red ticket, and all of the paid students a green ticket, um, as we want to keep that information confidential as to who is free, reduced, or paid. Um, and school districts are responsible for documenting the accuracy of any computer software system. The page up on the screen here um, lists unacceptable meal counting systems. And I'm not gonna read through all of these to you, but as an example, we mentioned earlier, trade counts cannot be used. And you may be wondering why that is. 
And as the handout explains, this does not provide an accurate count of reimbursable meals. It only provide, provides a count of the number of trays used. So there are no controls to ensure that those trays contained all the necessary food items, that trays were not stuck together, or maybe the student dropped the tray and the meal had to be replaced. Um, another example of an unacceptable meal counting system is attendance counts or classroom counts in the morning. Just because that student was there in the morning and indicated that they wanted to receive a school meal doesn't mean that they did indeed receive that meal. For example, maybe they got sick and went home before lunch and never actually ate that lunch for the day. So as you can see, there's there are a lot of reasons why the meal counts must be documented as the student actually receives the meal at the end of the service line. Go ahead and go to the next page. And this is a, um, a handout that talks about offer versus serve in the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program. If you are the person in charge of the point of service meal count, you will need to know how to identify a reimbursable meal. And in order to do that, there are some basic things you need to know about offer versus serve. Offer versus serve um, is, a provision, is a provision in the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program that allows students to decline some of the food offered. The goal of offer versus serve is to reduce food waste in the school meals program while permitting students to choose the foods they want to eat. It also helps reduce overall food cost. Offer versus serve cannot be utilized in the after school snack program, which we will be talking about a little bit later um, in this webinar. First up, um, we can go over offer versus serve at lunch. Offer versus serve is required for lunches served in high schools and highly encouraged for junior high, middle, and elementary schools, but not required at those grade levels. Um, the main points, the main things to point out here are at lunch, schools must offer all five food components in at least the minimum required quantities for each grade group. The five components that must be offered are meat, meat alternates, grains, fruits, vegetables, and fluid milk. At lunch, students must select at least three of the five required food components, including at least a half a cup of fruit and or vegetable in order for the meal to be claimed for reimbursement. Meals must be priced as a unit and the student pays the same amount regardless of whether they take three, four, or five of the food components. The students can decide which foods to decline and <clears throat> Like we talked about, all students have to take at least the three of the five components offered, including at least a half a cup of serving of fruit or vegetable and full servings of the other selected components. Um, it's important to communicate with the meal planner to know how the food items credit for the meal. Um, there's a couple examples there at the bottom. So for example, when like the meat meat alternate is provided in, in two meals, two menu items, such as a cheese stick and yogurt, the student must take at least the minimum daily serving size, depending on the grade group, for it to count as one of the components. So for, for grades K through five and six through eight, that would be one ounce. So they could take the cheese stick or the yogurt, but for grades nine through 12, they're required to have two ounces of meat meat alternate per day. So they would need to take both the cheese stick and the yogurt for it to count as the meat meat alternate component. When the meal includes multiple grain items and the student selects more than one, um, a half a cup of pasta or and a one ounce roll, only one grain counts as a reimbursable component towards the offer versus serve. Um, and it also defines a food component versus a food item, which um, is important at breakfast as well. A food component is one of the five food groups that comprise a reimbursable meal, including meat, meat, alternate, grains, fruits, vegetables, and milk. And a food item is a specific food offered within the five food components. 
In some cases, the entree may credit for both the meat-meat alternate component and the grain component, such as with pizza. And in that case, the student could select the entree and then they would only need to select a half a cup of fruit or vegetable in addition to the entree to make a reimbursable meal. On to the next page right there. The chart um, summarizes the meal pattern requirements and the number of food components that students can decline. Um, so the left side shows what the meal planner must offer. They must offer the five components. And on the right side, it shows that the student can decline two of those components as long as they take that half cup serving of fruit or vegetable. Next, we'll go over offer versus serve at breakfast. Um, offer versus serve is optional at breakfast for all grade levels, but once again, it's strongly encouraged. Under offer versus serve at breakfast, schools must offer at least four food items from the three required food components. This, the required food components at breakfast are fruit, grains, and fluid milk. Students must select at least three of the food items, including at least a half a cup of fruit or vegetable. So for breakfast to be reimbursable under offer versus serve, schools must meet the following criteria. Um, like we said, they must um, plan to include the three required components, which at breakfast are grains, fruit, and milk. And then for all grades, schools must offer at least a one ounce equivalent of grains daily. Something a little bit different at breakfast is schools may offer a meat meat alternate in place of part of the grain component after they've offered that one ounce of grain daily. And schools must offer one cup of fruit, 100% juice or vegetable daily. Vegetables can be uh, substituted for fruits right now and students are required to take a half a cup of um, fruit or vegetable. So remember up above we talked about a food item is a specific food offered within the three food components. So for example, a breakfast menu um, may be cereal and toast, and that would be two food items from the grain component, grapes, which would be one food item from the fruit component, and milk, which would be one food item from the milk component. Um, and that would meet the offer versus serve breakfast requirements because the food components, um, because there would be three food components and four food items are offered. Um, if offer versus serve is not implemented, students must leave the serving line with all food items. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, the next handout in the packet is more of a visual illustration of the difference in the meal planner versus the point of service responsibilities. Um, the form is something you might want to keep with you at the point of service. The blue boxes on the left side show the responsibilities of the menu planner and what the menu must include to meet the meal pattern requirements. The yellow boxes on the right side show what the student must select in order for the in order for the meal to be reimbursable. So at lunch, um, the point of service person is responsible for checking the tray that there are three components, including a half a cup of fruit or vegetable. And down at the bottom at breakfast, um, the tray has to contain the three food items, including a half a cup of fruit or vegetable. If the student gets to you at the point of service and they do not have the required um, components on their tray, you can ask them to go back and select additional items to make a reimbursable meal. If the student does not select a reimbursable meal, then that meal cannot be claimed for reimbursement. Up next is, um, here is a link to the USDA's Offer versus Serve Guidance Manual for the School Meals Program. If you would like to read more about Offer versus Serve and review some more examples of what constitutes a reimbursable a reimbursable meal, um, this is a good, good resource. The next page is from the Nutrition Services website and uh, shows where you can find information on meal counts and claims. On the website under forms and resources, um, you can find 
the meal counts and claims and the following resources. So that counting meals form we went over, attachment J, the edit check worksheet, which we'll be going over um, next here, attachment I, the on-site review, which we will also cover later in the presentation, and the point of service waiver um, if you need that, if the point of service is not at the end of the serving line. This is the edit check uh, worksheet, attachment J. This is discussed in part four of the online bookkeeper training. Um, but as the determination is made that students, that the student has a reimbursable meal, they are then counted by category of paid, free, and reduced. And a daily total of each category is required for each meal. The majority of schools utilize software programs specifically designed for counting and compiling this meal count information. Um, for those of you that do not use, utilize a software system, um, you can use a manual system. Um, once the daily count of paid, free, and reduced students has been determined, this information is entered into attachment J. And as I showed you up above, it is available as a printable form or as an Excel spreadsheet on the Nutrition Services website. The top portion of the form requires the name of the feeding site and the month and the year for which meals were served. And the form is completed for each day of the month with the daily meal counts recorded for paid, free, and reduced meals. The total of each category paid, free, and reduced for the month is then recorded in the total at the bottom of each column. The form can also be used for counting special milk and for tracking adult meals. Adult meals cannot be claimed for reimbursement, but um, can be recorded here. If your software system provides the daily count of paid free and reduced price meals and compiles the totals for the month, then you can just print out that report from the top for the top portion, you do not need to re-record those numbers in the top portion of the, of the uh, attachment J edit check worksheet. The bottom portion or the bottom section of attachment J here is the required edit check. This section is completed before submitting your claim into the CMP system and the form serves as a double check for accuracy in the, in the claiming numbers. If your school is using um, a software system for meal counting, it may already have the capability um, to complete the edit check, but not all software systems have the edit check feature. So if your system does not provide the information required for the edit check, then you need to complete that bottom portion of attachment J and keep it on file um, with your claim documentation for the month. In order to complete the bottom portion, um, fill out A, which is the day served, and that refers to the number of days in the month that meals were served for each meal type. B is the enrollment, and obviously that's the number of students that are enrolled for the feeding site and have access to meal service. C is the average daily attendance, and that is calculated by taking the, the total of each day's attendance at the feeding site and then dividing by the number of days the meals were served. Um, remember to always round up when you're referring to the number of students. So if you come up with 102.5, you need to round up to 103 as it's impossible to have a half of a student. And D is the attendance factor. Um, it, that's the average daily attendance divided by the enrollment. Letters E, F, and G record the highest number of students eligible for free, reduced, and paid meals in the month. If a student's eligibility changes during the month, then the student should be counted in both categories. So for example, if the student is eligible for reduced meals at the start of the month, and then the family turns in a new income eligibility application later in the month and you determine that they are now free, you would record that student in both the um, highest number of free um, eligible students and the highest number of reduced eligible students. So 
you would record them in both places. Um, as we move down the form, we see the required edit check portion. We, we've already determined the attendance factor and the highest uh, number of eligible students approved for the month. So when you multiply those, you get the attendance adjusted eligible number of students for the month. Um, the information in the box instructs us that, that the number of meals claimed by category cannot exceed the figures reported on lines E, F, or G on any given day. So that's one thing you want to check when you're filling out this form that no days, um, you don't have any days where you exceed the highest number um, of students you had eligible for free, reduced, or paid meals. And if the number of meals claimed by um, category exceeds the figures on lines H, I, or J on any given day, then those meals must be circled above and the reason for the discrepancy documented either at the bottom of this form or on the back of the page. Or if your system does the edit check worksheet, um, you would still want to do that portion of it and document the reason on that edit check um, from your software company. An example of why this might happen would be maybe all the students in a particular category were in, in attendance and ate on their favorite uh, pizza meal day or something like that. Next page. Next is an example of a claim for reimbursement in the CMP system. Um, claims for reimbursement are um, entered into the CMP system by logging in, logging in and clicking on claims. Um, you then want to click on the month for the claim you wish to enter and click on add original claim. You then add, um, click on add by the site name you wish to enter the claim for. In lines G1 through G3, this is where you're going to enter that highest number of students approved for free, reduced, or paid meals for the month. And note that that, that number may not add, or it may add up to more students than enrolled in your school, um, since students might be counted in more than one, than, in more than one category. Um, <clears throat> the attendance factor will automatically populate after you enter some of the information below. You enter um, the number of operating days, the number of days meals were served that month, and enter the average daily attendance. Then go ahead and enter the total number of free, reduced, and paid meals for lunch and breakfast and if you were participating in after school snack, after school snack would also be on here. Um, the totals will then auto populate. The claim is then in validated status and you'll click on continue and then um, certify that the information is correct by checking the box. Then click on submit for a pay payment and click finish. The claim status should show as accepted and you should receive an email saying the claim has been accepted. There is a short tutorial on the Nutrition Services website that goes through um, those steps for submitting the claim. Next is the claims for reimbursement due dates and payment dates. Just a few um, important reminders there. Claims can be submitted anytime after the final meal or snack of the month has been served for the claim month. Um, every month, it would be a good idea to reconcile your claim payments with your bank statement to make sure you receive the proper reimbursement. And it talks about that accepted status. So claim status uh, in the CMP system must show as accepted in order to be paid. If a claim status shows as validated or pending, this means that the claim has not been submitted for payment. So you need to return to the CMP system to complete the certification step required to submit the claim. A claim in accepted status can be modified if you need to change it for some reason, if you need to change the numbers, but you will need to resubmit after the changes have been made. And please note, if you click on modify after a claim has been accepted, even if you don't make any changes, just because you clicked on modify, um, you need to resubmit it. Um, in, order for, in order for it to be paid. 
the box, um, the next box talks about claim payment um, of electronic um, claim payment or electronic fund transfer dates. Um, claims submitted on the 10th before noon, um, NDE will process those on the 10th of the month and then you'll receive payment within two to three days. NDE processes claims on the 10th, 15th, and 20th of every month. If you submit a claim after the 20th, it'll be processed on um, the 10th of the following month. The last date to submit a claim is 60 days following the last day of the month covered by the claim. So for example, for your August claim, you have until October 30th to make sure that you get the claim submitted for August. I wouldn't recommend waiting um, until the 60th day to submit the claim, just in case something happens um, with the system or you can't get it to go through, you wanna give yourself a little bit of leeway to get that claim entered before the 60th day. Okay, and now I will turn it over to Mary Ann for setting meal prices. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, so I'll be talking about meal prices and, and paid lunch equity. This is a handout that we update annually, which is going to be based on USDA's current rates of reimbursement. Um, this two-page handout is going to address um, meal prices for students as well as adults, and it also discusses the pricing of a la carte items. Um, to begin with, you know, with determining um, student meal prices, we've given different examples, different ways in which you can determine a district's paid student price for both breakfast and lunch um, based on, as I said, based on the current rates of reimbursement. Um, on page two, we talk about, um, you know, what, what price needs to be set for adult meals. Um, and we have pretty much spelled out how we, you know, every year Nutrition Services indicates um, what the meal prices, what schools should be charging for adult meal prices. And it is based on USDA's free rate of reimbursement, which this year is $3.51. Uh, the donated food value is 24 and a half cents per child per day. And the certified menu reimbursement is seven cents. So when we add that all up, it came out to $3, 3.825. And so we rounded that up to $3.85. For breakfast, um, for an adult, uh, adult price, we go with the severe need free rate of reimbursement, which this year is $2.26. And we include the state reimbursement, which is a nickel per breakfast. So when we combine those two, came out to $2.31, so we rounded that up to $2.35. Um, as I said, towards the bottom then, we also talk about um, uh, establishing, price, establishing a la carte prices. Um, if your school uh, allows students to purchase individual menu items, you wanna make sure that the a la carte price that you have set is high enough so that uh, the purchase of a meal is the better deal. And then we also know a number of schools will sell just a variety of a la carte items. And again, those prices need to be set in such a way that um, the school district is not losing money. The price charge for a la carte for an a la carte item should definitely, you should definitely recover your food cost. Okay, next we have um, paid lunch equity. Um, the paid lunch equity tool um, came out a number of years ago and basically um, school districts are asked to complete um, this tool each year unless you happen to be a non-pricing program. Um, from our website, if you scroll down a little bit, Allie, Yeah, there we go. Um, you can see that for 2021, uh, policy memorandum was released as well as the tool. And so it is, we ask school districts to complete this tool on an annual basis. 
it is an Excel form and completion of it will determine if a school district needs to raise its paid student lunch prices for the next school year. Generally, the PLE tool is released sometime in the spring, and so we ask that you complete it at that time. And then you need to share those results with your school board, uh, because your school board typically is going to be responsible for determining your student meal prices for the next year, but they should also see what the results are um, from having completed the PLE tool. USDA identifies in this policy memorandum each year what a district's average weighted price should be. So for school year 2021, that average weighted price is $3.09. That doesn't mean that that has to be the price, the prices that are being charged at your school, because we know over the years, um, school districts are always moving towards that average weight, weighted price that, US, that USDA has established. Um, USDA, you know, typically as a result of completing the tool, uh, school district, it may indicate that, you know, a district has fallen somewhat behind as far as um, keeping up with raising student meal prices. But USDA never wants a school district to have to raise their uh, paid student lunch prices more than 10 cents a year. However, um, if your school district truly needs to generate revenues, you can certainly charge more if necessary. Um, in completing the Excel spreadsheet, um, we ask that you create a PLE file and then you can save these Excel um, you can, you can um, save the tool each year and have that as a reference. And of course, um, you could, you know, you can always print out a paper copy of the PLE tool as well. Okay. Next. Charge policies. USDA required all school districts to create a charge policy as of July 1st, 2017. So we created this two-page handout um, to simply provide guidance in terms of what could be included in your district's charge policy. So the first thing that I would say is, you know, you should locate what your district's charge policy is. You know, its purpose is to address those households that fall behind in payment and how the school district is going to handle it. We ask that the charge policy be included in um, be included in your student handbook, and it should also be distributed at the beginning of the year along with the household meal application that gets sent out. And many school districts also include it on their website as well. Okay. Next. Non-program foods. Well, as you can see at the top, non-program foods are defined as non-reimbursable foods and beverages that are purchased and then sold by the school district's food service department. So this form, this two-page form, is part of the administrative review process. We ask schools to include all items that are sold during the one week of menus being reviewed to ensure that the prices charged exceed actual food costs. Again, I talked about it, just mentioned it a little bit earlier. You know, you cannot, you cannot you know, um, lose money in the sale of these a la carte items. Um, so it's broken down, you know, you can report your dairy charges. Yes, we've got um, a section for milk and then prices for the different entrees that are sold throughout the week. 
uh, the top of the next page, we are talking um, just other items that you may sell, other a la carte or smart snack items. And when the form is completed then, we are able to determine the percent profit that is earned by the school meals program. Next, we have Nebraska's competitive food rule. This rule states that nothing can be sold in competition with the school meals program from a half hour before meal service until a half hour after meal service. This applies to both breakfast and lunch. So, you know, no organization can sell any, you know, no, no organization can sell anything during, during these um, established times. And if your school district has vending machines, then those machines should be set on timers um, during this particular time frame. So that's the, that's the competitive food rule. And then about halfway down that page, we start talking about smart snacks. And if your school allows foods and beverages to be sold during the day, smart snacks are going to be the regulations that address what kinds of food items can be sold. And it's important to note that when we're talking about smart snacks, that the school day is defined as midnight the night before until 30 minutes after the end of the school day. So if any items are going to be sold during that time, they must be smart snack compliant. So to help with that process, we have created a couple of charts. Um, so first of all, we have this decision chart. Um, um, you know, the item, you know, on this particular, this is a two page chart. Um, this, the item must meet the nutrient standards that are identified there on the left hand side and also must meet one of the component groups that are listed on the right hand side. Um, in addition to referring to this decision chart, you can also um, obtain company information and have that on file as proof that the item that's being sold is smart snack compliant. Um, for any of these additional uh, food items, uh, foods or beverages that are being sold, uh, you, you must have documentation on file to demonstrate that these items are smart snack compliant. So on the back side then, we have a listing of beverages that can be sold, and the portion size is identified for elementary, middle, and high school students. Okay, um, over on the right hand side, you know, in regarding smart snack regulations, there are some exemptions and those items are listed there for you. Okay. We also have um, another chart was um, created to specifically address what products can be sold when there is an overlap of grade groups. So for example, um, you know, if a school district has a vending machine in the high school, which is available to students in grades seven through 12, okay, we would have an overlap of both grades six through eight as well as nine through 12. So if all students have access to that vending machine, it can only be stocked with beverages based on the grades six through eight guidelines. Some school districts have machines available during the day. Um, as a result of the wellness policy, a number of school districts you know, are not selling items throughout the day, but we do want to, um, we, we want to make these resources available to you in case they apply to your particular school district. Okay. 
can move on to the wellness policy. Purpose of the wellness policy is to um, address the health and well being of all children in school. Um, the handout that we have included here is an overview of things to consider, including in your district's wellness policy. All school districts have been required to have a wellness policy on file for a number of years now. Um, and one of the requirements is that each school district must have a wellness policy committee. And that committee must meet at least once a year. The final regulations regarding the wellness policy went into, went into effect July 1st of 2017. Um, and as a result, if you wanna scroll through that alley to yeah, it's four pages, different things that can be included in your policy, right. Um, and when those, final when those final regulations went into effect, this, this handout right here, if you wanna go back to the top of the assessment tool here, thank you. Um, when those final regulations were available, this assessment tool specifically addresses um, the sections that are to be included in the district's policy. And so we've been working with school districts, you know, the last few years to make sure that these different um, elements have been included in, in the policy. Now that the final regulations are out, um, school districts are required to complete an assessment of their well, wellness policy every three years. So when the final regs went into effect in 17, now, you know, now that we have, now that we're at 2020, um, that assessment was emailed to all schools last year. Um, so again, I would just, you know, ask that you check to see if it's been completed. Um, as a result of the pandemic, the deadline has been extended for school districts to complete their first assessment um, by next June. Um, the wellness policy, uh, should be posted on your school district's website, and many schools also choose to include it in their uh, student handbook as well. And now I turn it back over to Erica. Okay, next up we are going to talk about civil rights. Um, attachment, this is a attachment H1, the Civil Rights Summary, and it's found on the Nutrition Services website under Forms and Resources, um, attachment A through L. This attachment is required to be completed by November 15th as part of the verification process. Um, you record the number of students in the school district by ethnic and racial identity that qualify for free and reduced price meals. You need to keep this form in the school district's permanent school lunch file. You don't need to mail it to nutrition services or submit it to us, but we will ask to see when we ask to see it when we are on site for an administrative review. Next page. The USDA's um, non-discrimination statement is required for all material distributed to the public that addresses the school meals program. So school food authorities participating in the National School Lunch Program, School Breakfast Program, After School Snack Program, or Special Milk Program must include the non-discrimination statement in their student handbook in the section that addresses access to or information about the school meals program. It must also be included on the school's website if the school meal information is available. So please go and check your handbooks and your website and ensure that you have the most recent version of the non-discrimination statement. All the wording in that black box um, must be included. The USDA's um, and Justice for All poster must also be displayed at each feeding site in a location that is visible to all students during meal service. And this form also includes the procedure to uh, follow for accepting and filing complaints of discrimination in the school meals program. 
if you ever receive a civil rights complaint, it must be forwarded to the administrator of the Nebraska Department of Education Nutrition Services, so to our office within five days. The form also outlines the information that needs to be obtained for verbal complaints. Oh, let me scroll down, Ali. There you go. Um, so there's that bullet verbal complaints and it lists the, the items one through six that you need to obtain um, if you are taking information um, from somebody about a civil rights complaint. Annual civil rights training for all staff involved in the school meals program must be conducted. Um, to complete this training uh, requirement, one option would be to, to read and review this civil rights form with staff. Make sure to document the training date and include an, an attendance roster. There is also a new one hour civil rights training available from the Institute of Child Nutrition um, that staff could view to fulfill this requirement. Um, and we can get that link sent out to you guys. Okay, moving on. The, um, this form talks about the administrative review and what to expect the day of the review. Administrative reviews are conducted at least once every five years. Um, the reviews are done to ensure the school is in, in compliance with the USDA rules and regulations for the school meals program. There is both an off-site and on-site portion of the review. The off-site involves answering um, some questions before we get to your school. And then this also uh, form shows what we will be reviewing on site um, as well. So as you can see, many of the topics correspond to uh, information we've covered today. The bookkeeper portion um, includes reviewing your direct certification list and the, and the free and reduced applications and making sure that those have been all processed correctly. We will reconcile a monthly claim, um, ensure that the verification report has been completed and that you have done verification for the year. Um, we'll review the financial pieces such as meal prices, the charge policy, and purchases made from the nonprofit food service account and civil rights compliance. Um, in addition, while we're there, we'll also observe meal service and re review food service records um, and ensure that reimbursable meals are being served and selected by students. And then, yeah, at the bottom, if your school operates any of those programs, the fresh fruit and vegetable, after school snack, or special milk program, we would also conduct a review of those programs at that time as well. This is um, the professional standards um, for all school nutrition employees handout. USDA has established minimum professional standards requirements for school nutrition professionals who manage and operate the national school lunch and school breakfast programs. The training standards for all nutrition um, program employees are determined by position and I'll review these um, on the next form when I get to that section. And in addition, you go ahead and scroll down Allie um, to the next page. In addition, USDA has created minimum hiring standards for new school food, uh, food authority directors based on a, a school district size. So one thing um, to update on this form as USDA has not created a new handout for this yet, but um, it, where it says relevant school food service experience, um, that has been changed to just um, any type of food service experience for the hiring standards. Okay, next page. This is NDE's professional standards training requirements and online resources handout. Um, the box at the top outlines the annual training requirements based on position. 
So for example, the program director or your food service director is required to have 12 hours of training each school year. You're probably noticing that there is no bookkeeper uh, title listed in this chart. And this is because there is no minimum number of required hours for the bookkeepers for the school lunch program. But we would expect that um, to see that you had completed training relevant to your position. So if NDE is offering a webinar on direct certification and that's something that applies um, to your job duties, then that's something you would want to participate in and document those training hours. Under the important points, um, note that all trainings must be documented. Uh, documented on a training tracker or log and links to those are, are provided there. The bottom portion of the form um, and on to the next page are just links to current training opportunities available and I'll let you explore those on on your own time but many can be completed um, online um, online if you don't want to do them in person. And Next page. This is just a list of the professional standards learning codes for the school food service staff. And then the next page is a template or an example of a training log that can be used to document training um, for a specific training event. And that's all I have. So I'll turn it over to Sean to go over um, after school snack. Thank you, Erica. The next section of your packet is the after school care snack program. We've included this in your packet because oftentimes this is a program where food service provides the after school snack, but another program implements the point of service count and the monitoring aspects of the program. The page that we are looking at right now is the meal pattern for the after school snack program. As we move on down to the next page, we can see that the program also requires the completion of a daily production record that demonstrates that the meal pattern requirements have been met. So the documentation piece is of utmost importance. And then as we move on down, we can see that the after school snack care program also requires on-site reviews. It requires two different on-site reviews to be completed, one during the first four weeks of operation and the second on-site review must be completed any time during the remainder of the school year. This completed form is retained on-site and is not submitted to our office. The after-school care snack program requires daily snack counts to be compiled for the monthly claim for reimbursement. Snacks can be claimed either as all free based on the site's full enrollment being over 50% free and reduced, or by individual students' eligibility for those sites where the school enrollment is less than 50%. We'll move on down. The next section of your packet um, addresses USDA foods. USDA Foods is not administered by Nutrition Services, but through the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we have listed the coordinator and staff assistant on this form for any questions you may have about your school's utilization of USDA Foods. We ask that you contact one of these individuals. The next page of the handout addresses um, the different options for receiving meals. We've included um, the various meal service agreements that are available on the Nutrition Services website. These are for schools that purchase meals from another school 
or for a commercial or from a commercial vendor. Um, so there are different types of agreements and an example of this would be perhaps maybe a a private school or a non-public school receives their meals um, from a public school and so they would need to have a meal service agreement in place. And so as I said, there's different examples of of those types of contracts on the nutrition services website. The next section of your packet is on the on-site reviews. On-site reviews look at the meal counting and claiming procedures of individual sites. On-site reviews must be completed for each school year for sponsors that have more than one feeding site. For lunch, the on-site review is completed for each feeding site. For breakfast, the on-site reviews are completed for 50% of the sites. This form is required to be completed by February 1st of each school year for each feeding site as we had, have already talked about and the form is retained on site. The next section of our packet addresses the annual financial report. The annual financial report is required to be completed for all non-public schools and institutions. Completion of the form is required by July 15th, and the form looks at the previous year's income and expenses. It can be found under the Applications tab on the CMP website. The next section of your handout, we will be reviewing procurement requirements of the school meals program, starting with the Buy American provision. This provision states that to the maximum extent possible, school food authorities will purchase domestically grown and processed food products for the federal school meals program. There are few exemptions and if necessary, the school food authority must complete a Buy American Justification form, which is found on the next page, if requiring an exemption. The form is completed and retained on site. Every sponsor participating in the school meals program is required to have a code of conduct regarding procurement procedures. We've included a sample template in your packet that addresses what should be contained in your code of conduct. Along with the code of conduct, Every sponsor is required to have a documented procurement plan. We have included a sample template in your packet. And as we go on down, it addresses all the different procurement scenarios. And we'll keep going to the next form, which, which is besides the administrative review, which Erica has talked about, um, sponsors are also required um, to ensure that they are procuring goods and services um, according to the federal um, guidelines for procurement. Um, and so along with the administrative review, our agency, the state agency also conducts a 
procurement review. And this form gives you an idea of some of the questions that we will be asking during the procurement review. The procurement review is required for sponsors every six years, or for some sponsors, this might be more frequently. Information on this page provides some examples of that information that the reviewer may ask um, when they conduct the procurement review. That is the end of the packet. And so now we are available to answer any questions that you may have. Um, if you'd like to enter your questions into the chat box, that'd be great. Or if you'd like, you can certainly unmute um, your microphone and ask your questions to us now. We covered a lot of information today. So is there anything that you have questions on that we can address for you? I have a question. My name is Janice Bosland and with the, um, the entire school is now moving to the SFSP program. So the August claims are going to have the free and reduced numbers. Does the September claim, being that the entire school is now on free lunch, claim everybody is free, or do we still keep the numbers of what people have been approved and certified for? Janice, that's such an excellent question. Um, USDA guidance has said, and in, in recently released as of last Friday, that schools have the option to begin the summer food service program um, from the beginning of the school year. Um, so that is definitely an option that's available, but um, that would require refunding all of your student accounts and then we would have to do a revision of your August claim. You can certainly start the summer food service program at any point, um, and many schools are opting to do it, you know, September 1st or even later so that they have ample time to inform their families. And some schools do not have the administrative um, ability to go back and refund student accounts. So it's that date that your school has determined that it is participating in the summer food service program. USDA also issued guidance that says that a, a sponsor, a summer food service sponsor, does not have to have um, a completed application or an approved application to begin participation. Um, you would have to have an approved application before submitting a summer food service claim, but that does give you a little bit of leeway in getting that process completed. So my question, I guess, back to you is, when has your school determined that it is participating in the summer food service program? We are starting at September 1st. Okay. And we've, we're notifying everybody today. And sure. I am in the process of, of uh, refunding everyone that's paid for lunch as of September 1st through today. And we've altered our software so that they will no longer be charged the fee for the paid lunch. So that how do I claim, does the claim for September then claim the entire school is free or do I still claim, how do I claim September? Well, September is going to be claimed under the summer food service program because you are starting participation as of September 1st. Okay, and that's a different claim form in the claim form section of the website. Yes, it is. Okay. And it's, and it requires an application for participation in the summer food service program. Thank you. You bet. Sean? Yes. I would just add, I think um, Katie is getting ready to actually send an email later today or tomorrow, right? Regarding the changes as far as claims, how claims can be, sub you know, schools can make that change regarding claim submission. Yes, she is. Um, yeah. Janice, um, did point out that they are beginning um, participation as of September 1st. So nothing needs to happen with your August claim. Your August claim is submitted under the school meals program. 
moving forward, your September claim will be under the Summer Food Service Program. Sean, there are some, a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, the first one is if we, if we use PowerSchool, do our record, to do our record keeping, do we need to fill out attachment J? Now, does PowerSchool have the function of the edit check? I, last I knew it did not. In the bottom portion of the meal count, the required edit check that Erica um, reviewed would still need to be completed. Right, so you could use the reports for the top portion, but you would still need to, to complete the bottom portion, the edit check. Correct. Um, the next one is, um, who do we notify that we want to go to the SFSP program? Katie Parch sent out an email to um, schools last Friday afternoon. Um, it was released around between four and five last, last Friday. And in that email that would have went to your school's authorized representative, um, it detailed what needed to be ha happen. And there is an access form that needs to be completed. That can be found on the Nutrition Services homepage. Um, that form must be completed so that we can know what your intention is of participating in the Summer Food Service Program. Next one, um, you mentioned that if a student lunch status changes, we need to notify them. I am new at this and wonder the easiest way to determine the change if I have already updated them to this year's status. Um, I do have a book on file, but wonder if there was some sort of report I could pull to help me with this. Well, if, if the household applied, you know, whether a student's name shows up on the direct certification list or if the household submitted an application, you are required to notify all households of their eligibility. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's, is that what you're asking about? Um, notifying all households? As I said, we have attachment D, um, that approval letter, uh, approval or denial letter that can be sent to your households. Um, when I was talking about, you know, lunch status changing, um, I think that I was talking about attachment D3, where, say, for example, we're out on a review, and if we determine there is an error, then the household needs to be notified, and then you would have to give them, you know, a 10 calendar day notice. Um, the same thing may also occur as a result of verification. You know, a household that may have qualified initially on their application as free, as a result of verification, maybe they now qualify for reduced. So again, um, you know, their benefit, their benefit has changed. Um, and so the household would need to be contacted that they now have a 10 calendar day notice um, before they have to, you know, begin paying for their students' meals. Did that, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay. Sure. I can do the next question, Erica. I see where you're at now. Um, the next one is, when would we be notified that we have been approved for SFSP after submitting our application? Um, I'll take that one. Um, you have, I, I think you're asking after you complete the access form, when would you be notified? And a program specialist would be assigned to provide you what we call rights into the system um, for the Summer Food Service Program. And they would send you an email telling you those rights have been granted so that you, and there's also a, a guide for completing the application that would be sent 
And so you would receive that information via email. And I just want to say that waiver number 56 from USDA that allows this, every school in Nebraska or, or a large majority of schools are choosing to participate in the summer food service program. So that email from that program specialist may take a, a couple of days to get to you just because of the large volume of interest in participating in the summer food service program. So please be patient. Um, we will give you the same time and attention that we are giving each one of our sponsors that apply. Well, once you complete that access form, you are on our radar and you will be contacted. Um, can I butt in and just ask, um, can we start just notifying parents or should I wait until I receive the confirmation that we are good to move forward? Renee, what a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, once you have completed that access form, you, you can begin the program. You, as I said, you don't need an approved application. You don't need to submit your application. You can begin participation. USDA made this back to the beginning of the school year. If a, a, a sponsor would choose to go back to the beginning of the school year. So that's where we're at with that. Do notify your households that you can begin participation. Thank you. And I've also included the link to the access form in the chat box. Okay, I have another question. Um, if we choose to go back to the start date of school of 818 and I haven't finished my August claim yet, what would be a disadvantage to starting 818? We found a way to easily refund accounts. Um, well, you have found a way to easily refund accounts. Um, you have not entered your claim in the school meals program for August. You would need to get, we need to get your application um, approved, completed and approved um, to submit the claim for meals, the summer food service meals in August. Um, I, I think the disadvantage would be that you would not receive probably as timely a payment from our office because you haven't started the process yet of completing the application and it hasn't been approved. Um, that would probably be the, the disadvantage is that it, you probably wouldn't get payment at this point till October for August meal. I think that's probably realistic at this point. I don't believe there's any more. Um, Christy, speak up if that didn't answer your question. Um, Amy had asked a question, but I think we answered it. There's no more questions in the chat box, but if someone has a question or there's one that I didn't see, please speak up. Now with this big development with moving to the summer food service program, um, schools are still, still need to take free and reduced applications and determine eligibility of students, even though those meals will be provided free of charge to the students. The summer food service program, the waiver is only extended through December 31st. As of right now, it's back to normal counting and claiming and the school meal pattern in January. So you must continue efforts to get students approved for meal benefits. I have another question. It's Janice Boslin. Sorry to bother you. 
if we're completing that edit check form for the month of August, is the edit check necessary then if the entire school is free for going for September, October, November, and December? The edit check is part of the school meals program. If you begin participation in the summer food service program, there is not a required edit check. Thank um, you. Yeah. There are two separate programs. The school meals program is a different program from, from the summer food service program, both requiring a different application and a different claim. There is going to be training tomorrow afternoon on the requirements of the summer food service program that I encourage you to attend um, that will outline um, the requirements of that program. And where do we find that training? Um, in the email that was sent last Friday from Katie Park that had the information about the access form, the Zoom link was included in that email. Um, as Marianne mentioned, Katie will be sending out an email probably later today outlining the steps um, for a school with the claiming process, and I am sure she will be sending that Zoom link again. Amy asked, will the webinar be recorded? I will not be able to attend. Yes, I'm sure the webinar will be recorded and made available on our website. We're hanging out for any more questions you might have. This is your opportunity. How about any questions about the information we talked about today? I'm so glad that we explained everything so clearly. Um, and thank you for your time and attention today. We appreciate it. I know Things are very busy at your school as well as our office. So thank you very much. Is there anything else before we close the meeting down? I have another question. It's Janice Boslin again. Um, sure. The civil rights packet or part that we need to do is we just need to make sure that everyone that's employed within the program reads it, logs that they've read it, and keep that on file with us so that if we are reviewed, you know that we've all done it, correct? Yes. Civil rights training is required annually. And Erica talked about the different options of getting that training. That um, new training released from the Institute of Child Nutrition um, looks like a very good one hour training. Um, as well as you can read the handout that we have provided in the packet, that, that suffices for training. What we are looking for when we come and do a review is that one, who has been trained? What did, what were they trained on? When were they trained? Um, so we are looking for that documentation piece. It came from Carly, the Buy American Justification Form. Does that include beef, pork? I'm sorry, then my chat disappeared. Um, the Buy American Justification Form, does that include beef, pork that was donated where we paid processing? No, no, because that is a product that is domestic. I am talking about non domestic products. So, that might be, an example would be, if we went into your storeroom and we saw that you had tomatoes from Mexico, okay? That would be an example of, well, why didn't you purchase tomatoes from U the US? 
So what would, what's the justification for purchasing a product that is readily available in the United States? If you read through the exemption form, um, it, it pretty, it's pretty much as clear on what would be an exemption and why, the reason behind requesting the exemption. My last question is, if we had any other questions after today, who do we contact? Well, Janice, you can contact any of us. Um, on, <laughs> we're here to, to assist you and how you would find our contact information is on the Nutrition Services um, homepage. Under Quick Link, there is, um, if you click on that, there's all kinds of great information. And there is also contact us. And then all of our names are listed with our email address. Mm -hmm. I did add the link to the training tomorrow, Sean, in the chat box if someone wants to grab that quickly too before they jump off. Sure, thank you so much, Allie. I just added the link for the um, civil rights training for at ICN. Well, if there's not anything else, I think we will leave the meeting. Thank you again, everyone, for your time and attention this afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.